All right, we are finishing off the book of Numbers by looking at two giant killers, uh, Joshua and Caleb. There's another sermon that deals specifically more with them. I'm looking at more stuff that relates to us and the giants that we face. Back when I was in seminary, I had to do a senior sermon and I wanted to do Romans 12, 1 and 2, which also happened to be one of the passages I had been assigned in my Romans class. So I figured, hey, that's good. And I started thinking about what are the areas that people need to uh, have transformed minds about. And I came up with uh, three areas that um, you're going to hear about today. Uh, renewal, which is getting your act together. Relationships, which is like getting it through the auditions for you theater people. And then uh, responsibility, taking it up on, taking it on the road. Because I, I had observed, although I'd only been around Christianity for a handful of years, that uh, people really weren't renewed, they had bad relationships, and they weren't doing what the scripture said they should be doing. Duh. Um, and after three decades of observing the same thing, I realized, yeah, it's, it's, things haven't changed much. Of course, in this body, it's way different. Uh, I was really gratified to hear in the praises that in each of these areas, I heard people talking about things that um, God was doing in their lives because they are facing those giants. A giant is something that is bigger than you. Uh, that kind of makes you want to quit, give up, think, oh, I can't do this. And that's kind of not a good attitude to have. If God says he wants to do something, he always gives the grace to do it. And you wind up uh, losing if you, there we go. Um, you know, fail to rise to the occasion. People are motivated by usually one of two things, fear or desire. And I am much more a desire person. Um, I see something that I like, I, I want that. Uh, you know, fear, it's like, ah, eh, you know, uh, it's, it's, I'm not a fear person. And for the first 10 or so years of trying to minister to people, I thought that you know, most people would be motivated by desire. But I realized that they are often just bound and, you know, sh shackled by fear. And then as I recalled from the book of Deuteronomy, which we're going to be seeing in future weeks, just a couple times, just highlights, that when God gives the blessing and cursing section, the cursing section, things to avoid, outnumber the um, blessings. Because he recognizes that the way we're constituted is we tend to be more motivated as a whole by uh, fear than desire. I remember trying to tell people, look, there's this great oasis off the side of this road. It's like, you know, it's great. It's got trees. It's got sweet water. It's got date trees. It's just like, you just have to take a couple steps off the track to get there. People wouldn't move. But when you said, the train's coming and you're going to be flatter than a pancake, oh, well, maybe then they would consider taking the steps off the road. And it's like, I didn't realize people were operated like that, but they tend to. Nation of Israel on a whole were, op were basically motivated by fear. But not fear of God, fear of the wrong things. And um, you know, people, this is a new thing called fear of missing out. I think it's a letters. What's it called? FOMO. FOMO, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I should have been able to figure that out. <laughs> um, as opposed, they, they actually should be motivated by FOMO of eternity. Um, but they are more motivated by FOMO of, you know, something temporal that's not going to be worth it the next week. So, and I think the church has largely contributed to this incorrect view um, for a number of reasons, one of which is Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. The others are looking for audiences and don't want it to say anything that people don't like to hear. Um, so, Numbers 13, 27, this is... Kadesh Barnea passage. This is the one that First Corinthians talks about, which is why I gave you the First Corinthians passage. This is one specifically written for us in the New Testament. Uh, when God tells the nation of Israel to go take the promised land, the, the spies had gone into the land. They saw it was good. Uh, they were actually pretty brave guys who went up and did it, but then they kind of looked at the wrong things and then everything went downhill from there. So Caleb says in Numbers 13, 27, let's go up at once. I guess he was a J. And take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Good guy. Probably an E um, as well. And he wants to go do it. And everyone else says, no, we are not able to go up. So it was two against ten in terms of the spies. And the majority, uh, the herd, is always headed to slaughter. 
And basically they wound up you know, dying in the wilderness because of that. First Corinthians 5 tells us with most of them, uh, a couple million actually, God was not well pleased. Uh, he scattered their bodies in the desert. And these are examples for us. You read the context, I didn't want to fill up your sheet with verses that you have in your Bible. Um, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they did nor rebel, nor put Christ to the test, nor be idolaters, or you know, any other stuff that's in there in the following verses. Uh, the big thing is they desired what is wrong. And my perspective on the Christian life is the reason why people get messed up repeatedly is they desire the wrong things. Even if that wrong thing is staying right where they were. You know, it's not like they want to go get something, they just want to be where they are. They, they have comfort and security as they're idol as opposed to God's will. So, um, when I graduated from college, I started researching all the stuff that uh, causes success. And one of the things that is, you know, repeated in every single success story is that it started out really difficult. It was hard. People failed. They failed multiple times. Um, and the people who had success and got it easily often lost it. And uh, I always got a kick out of the people who made and lost fortunes multiple times. I think they would have learned something along the way. They had the skill to make a fortune, but they didn't have whatever it took to maintain it. Um, but we tend to shy away from things that are difficult. Um, it's just part of, I guess, being a fallen human creature. But let me ask you this question. Satan is stronger than we are. Right? Totally. He's the highest created being. He's infinite, and not infinite in his power, but he's got you know, more power than any other finite being. He's smarter. He's been around longer. So since he's stronger than we are, shouldn't we just give up and let him have his way with us? Like, why would we bother fighting him? You know, if, if, if it's going to be hard, well, then give in. I'll make it a whole lot easier. Not quite. <laughs> because once you're under his dominion, it becomes really, really bad. Remember, he tempts and entices with something that looks good. And then once he has his claws into you, you start squeezing and it hurts. Anything worthy will face opposition as we swim upstream against Satan's stream to the sewer. So every time I go across the Hudson, I think it's going down, it's going out. We need to go up. That's where reproduction and life happens if you're salmon. Um, we don't have salmon in Hudson River as far as I know. But... Um, Every time it rains, I, I, I look at what's going into the sewer. The streets are getting cleaned. All that trash is going to the sewer. And people are basically doing the same thing. So we need to basically develop some muscle spiritually and intellectually to be able to avoid going with the herd to slaughter down the sewer. When we focus on the obstacles, they get larger. The more you look at something, the bigger it looms in your mind. Temptation is like that as well. And as the majority of the nation of Israel looked at the giants, or the majority of the spies and then the nation, you know, they got larger and larger and larger until they said, oh yeah, and we were grasshoppers in their sight. Uh, no, that is hyperbole because, you know, there's no way that you would be a grasshopper and they would be, you know, it's just like... You were a little small. You were smaller than they were, but yeah, you know, they were probably ten feet tall, um, and they were five feet tall. So they're not being twice as big. That isn't that's not grasshopper territory. But you know, you lose perspective. You, you kind of think of the boogeyman and things that aren't even real. Is the boogeyman real? Um, <laughs> as bigger than they actually are, and you basically give them power over you. Instead, when we focus on the opportunity to draw on God's grace, we see Him as larger. And the dynamic of this is really simple. God has allowed this into my life for my benefit. He will supply all I need to make it happen. Therefore, I can trust him and face this. So if God said, go and kill the giants, I'll be with you. If they had the track record of obeying God, then there wouldn't have been a problem. And Joshua and Caleb had that. Joshua, you can understand how he got it. Because he was with Moses. He was in the tent of meeting. He saw the glory of God. Caleb, the guy was amazing. He just uh, you know, probably put it together and um, decided to trust God. 
So in Caleb's mind, and this should be in our mind as well, if God commands, he provides. Now, if God says be holy, he gives us the resources for being holy. If God says kill the giants, he gives us the re resources for killing the giants. If God says march around Jericho seven times and the walls will fall down, he's going to make them fall down. So we, we need this mindset that if he commands, it's possible. Now, the, and I'm thinking, okay, you see this in the scriptures. Why don't we see this in everybody's life? Because the scriptures clearly say, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. In other words, God gives grace, which is power, to do the good things, the good works that he created you to do. He's going to make it happen. Yet, we tend not to believe that because most people come into Christianity through some evangelistic preaching that says, you can't do anything. And then all the believers are sitting around listening to that saying, right, I can't do anything. And then we get together and praise God that he saves us who can't do anything. And that's what I call worm theology. And he didn't save us to be a bunch of worms. He saved us to be warriors. So um, we need to understand God's purpose in saving us God's plans for us and realize that if he tells us to do it, he will make it possible to happen. So we fail to understand God's big purposes and things. Here's just one verse out of it. First, that's 523. Um, and God may sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless in the day that Christ comes. He wants us to be blameless in what we do, that's our body, what we think, feel, value, and uh, what else is in there? Body, soul. Uh, that's our soul. And then in our, our motivations and desires, and our spirit. He, he wants that all to be holy, sanctified. Be holy as God is holy. God is holy in every part of his being, in every part of his actions, in every part of his intentions. Um, in a sense of being you know, pure and good. Then the very next verse says, he who calls you is faithful, he will also do it. So then people say, all right, God, go ahead. You know, let me know if you need any help. Uh, I'm going to go do my thing now. No, 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 no. <laughs> if you read the letter earlier, there's stuff that we have to do that God will then uh, enable us to do it. If you notice, the nation of Israel didn't say, okay, God, go kill the giants. We'll stay here. Let us know when it's all ready. God said, no, you've got to go in there and swing the sword. I'll energize the sword. I'll cause your enemies um, you know, to fall upon each other. Uh, the pointy end go in them. And you know, it's like there's things that God would do, but they had to be engaged on the battlefield to make the thing happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. And for 40 years, it didn't happen because they were now out in the desert paying the consequences for their refusal to obey God. God gives us all we need. Um, I remember my first Navigator program uh, one summer. I think it was after I graduated. Second Timothy 1, we, we studied Second Timothy and we had to memorize it. Um, people didn't understand what they were memorizing. I realized like a year or so later, you know, I don't think people really got what this thing says. I didn't initially either, but then as I started thinking about it, I said, oh, it's saying that, but who knew? You have to think about it. Um, and then Joshua 1 8 is the next verse is going to tell you how to do that. God has not given us a spirit of fear. The King James Version said timidity. And, you know, the quintessential Christian was a timid person. Well, let's tiptoe around life because, like, we don't want to rock the boat. Um, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or understanding. Uh, literally, the word breaks down into saved understanding. Um, to think accurately and clearly about our world is a sign of a spirit-filled Christian. And uh, there aren't a lot of people who think accurately about our world, which kind of tells you how many spirit-filled people there actually are. And the reason for that is they failed to follow an instruction God gave Joshua. So there's actually a, a cool thing going on here that most people do not see. Because in order to see this, you have to remember what happened in the middle of Numbers 
then the end of Numbers, then the whole book of Deuteronomy until you get to Joshua. Because in Numbers, God said, go take the land. And the people said, no. And then they had to, you know, they wandered around in the wilderness for a while. Then they came back and you had the whole book of Deuteronomy, which is a lot of stuff. And it isn't until you get to the next book, Joshua, that they actually go in and take the land. You have to realize it was God's intent that they have it all the way back in Joshua. I mean, in Numbers. So in Joshua, Joshua is there before the Lord. And uh, God says, that verse 7 is good, but we'll just start pick it up in 8. This book of the law, the law, the law in which the godly person delights, according to Psalm 1, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. In other words, you know, get it into you and keep it there. Think about it. Meditate on it day and night. So I remember uh, the summer after I graduated from college, looking up the word meditate in Strong's uh, Concordance. It's like it was back in the day when you had paper books and you actually had to go find the page <laughs> and then go find the column and then go find the verse. And then go look up the number, and then, yeah, it's like you actually had to do some work back in those days. You could just press a button, boom, there it is. But I saw that it meant revolve in the mind, to turn it around, looking at it from different perspectives. And you know, I remember Eastern meditation is you know you just kind of emphasize this word and then you emphasize that word, and you know that's part of it. But you meditate on it that you may observe to do observe to do not just do it but be careful observe to do so i'm looking at it thinking how does this apply to my life all right this is where i came up with the definition meditation is thinking through implications for applications oh wow that rhymes we could do <laughs> chant on that all right so um you want to look at the scripture to see how it applies to your life. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Notice you don't automatically become prosperous. You still have to do it. So you get your marching orders from the word, and then you go apply it. And then God blesses you because you are now blessable. Uh, Psalm 119 is one of my favorite Psalms. Um, I don't quote it because... <laughs> memorize that I'm not going to but it, it one of the verses in there uh, frequently came to my mind when I was in grad school I have wonder studying understanding all my teachers because like testimonies are my meditation and you know I, I came into Christianity as a pagan more or less and there were these godly guys who've been doing this for years and I'm looking at the scriptures and I'm listening to what they're saying and I'm saying there's a disconnect here and I realized they were uncritical in their acceptance of what had gone before them. And they were just repeating the party line down through the, you know, the centuries, not centuries, years, probably decades. And you know, just having the scriptures, you could say, no, the scriptures say this. It, it doesn't say that. Because I meditated on the scriptures. It, it's still my favorite thing to look up words that I think I know and make sure I've got every nuance squeezed out of them. In fact, uh, one of my favorite things to do with Alexa, uh, when I'm having trouble, sorry, babe. Uh, <laughs> we have pillow talk. I ask her. What do you call a wizard in a Fred house? <laughs> in a <broken> <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I ask her to define words for me. And uh, you know, I'm going to actually give her that. Hopefully she'll cooperate. It's good reason it's got a female name. Anyway, um, so you meditate and then the very next verse on verse 9 says, God says, have I not commanded you? Let's think about that. Why is that being told? Well, if God commanded him to do it, God would provide what he needed. So be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Is that true of everyone? No, I think it's true of the people who are obeying verse 8, that the Lord is with them, because God is not with the people who have walked away from him. He is with those who are walking with him. Okay, now let's see if I can get, what's your name, to actually come up with this definition. Alexa, 
Wiki may define courageous. Courage the Cowardly Dog is an American No, Alexa, stop. <laughs> this actually worked. People heard it work. Alexa, Wiki may define courage. Courage is the choice and willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. Physical courage is bravery in the face of physical pain, hardship, death, or threat of death, while moral courage is the ability to act rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, discouragement, or personal loss. You can ask me to read more from Wikipedia. Okay. You catch one of the first words. It's a choice. It's a choice. Courage is actually a choice. Aristotle said it was the mean, golden mean between being scared of everything and being, you know, a rash idiot. Now, those weren't his words, but that was kind of the idea. <laughs> but it's a choice to actually face the difficulties and danger. You can go into uh, Wiki or uh, Wikipedia for its uh, actual definition of that. So we need to make a choice to trust God for the resources we need to do his will. Otherwise, we might find ourselves not doing it. A little incentive to do this, folks, for those of you who are motivated by fear. Um, Nation of Israel, in Numbers 14, 3, said, said the, the, the folks said, Why has the Lord brought us to this land to die? And I put the, little, the not is not in the original text. But was that, in there? <laughs> that was not what God did. God promised from day one to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. His purpose was not to bring them into the land to die, but they rejected his purpose of bringing them to the land for milk and honey. And as a result, they suffered. Caleb said, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of this land. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But they succumbed to the spirit of this world, which is the spirit of fear, rather than the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, which is the spirit of God at work in our lives. And what they did is they rejected and rebelled. There's a little rebel word there. They rebelled against the Lord and his purpose for them. Which brings us to here to see, rejecting God's purpose for our life is rejecting him in unbelief. God, I'm not going to give you glory. I'm not going to live for your glory. I'm not going to live for the future. I'm not going to live for the benefit of others. I'm going to live for me. That's rejecting God's purpose for your life. God's desire is that you give him praise because he gives you the victory over three areas of your life that we're going to explore in a few minutes, renewal, relationships, and responsibility. Failure to do that, failure to actually pursue those areas of, for lack of a better word, excellence, is a rejection of God's purpose for creating you, because he's not going to get praise anywhere else. So I had asked uh, the body for insights on uh, this passage. I got a bunch of them. I, I tried to sort them all out, and I tried to make them all fit together, and I had this, this monstrosity of it, an outline that I basically decided last night to scrap. And uh, I did trim it down. So there were some really good things in there. I'm not sure if I'll be able to work them in, but I'm sure in your vacations you can work these in. Uh, I got some great giant killing tips from uh, David. And when we get into the books of Samuel, if we ever do on this series, um, I will come back and delve more deeply into it. But remember what David, David had a... a you know, he comes down, he sees Goliath, and then he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who's defying the armies of the living God? And then he says, well, what would God give someone who actually kills this one? Or what the king gives someone? And he uh, finds out. And then he goes after it. So he developed a track record of trust and dependence on God. Remember where that came from? He killed the lion and the bear. <clears throat> he killed bears, boy. <laughs> Got to be careful around here. Um, and then God would, you know, God gave him strength to do that. Then God would give him strength for the bigger things. So you need to kind of start small, you know, maybe against a chihuahua first, and, and work your way up <laughs> to where you can fight lions and then go from lions to you know bears and, and giants. <laughs> um, the other thing I noticed about David is he had skills. And he, he didn't take Saul's armor because he didn't have any skill in that. It was like it wasn't him. He had a, a shepherd's staff and he had a sling 
and he had five stones because Goliath had some brothers. And uh, you don't find about that until somewhere later it mentions it. And he, he got the skills. And then he was most concerned for the glory of God. His concern wasn't, well, you know, what am I going to get from doing this? Although he did ask that. But his first comments were, who is this uncircumcised Philistine defying the armies of the living God? He was concerned for God's glory. Uh, and you see that again when he got the Davidic covenant was because he, he said, yeah, I'm living in this really nice cedar house and God's living in a tent. And God said, David, you know, it's really nice you're going to build me a house, but and I, I love this passage because it's a play on words and, you know, an innately wired to appreciate puns. Um, so my God made me. But he said, I'm going to build you a house, and he builds him a dynasty, or dynasty for you Brits in the audience. So those are three things to keep in the back of your mind. You want to track record of dependence on God. You need to get the skills. You don't just go out there and wave around your sword. You need the skills. And uh, you heard some about that in the praise time. And then you need to have most concern for the purpose of God because that's God's purpose for your life, to give him glory. And if you're not doing that, you're rejecting him. And you're not going to be living too happily after. Okay, so we're going to look at our three giants, renewal, relationships, and responsibility. We're going to look at some applications that the body had come up with. And then we're going to look at how do you know when the giant's actually dead and you've beaten it. So... Uh, this is uh, probably not going to get all the way through all of them, but um, I will be put incorporating some of this into a New Believer Survival Guide somewhere down the road in the not-too-distant century. <laughs> so, <laughs> most of you know our mantra for Big Apple Chapel is learn the truth, live the truth, and love others with the truth. Well, you're being pretty redundant there. Yeah, it's because the truth is really important. The truth is what, you know, basically... Uh, you need to counteract the lies of Satan more in the world. And that, you know, truth is empowered by the Holy Spirit and encouraged by the body of believers. Now, you probably get encouraged in our praise time, not just because the music's great, but because you hear how people are applying the truth to their lives, and it's changing them, and then you're motivated to do that as well. You hear how people are trusting God for things in ministry, and then you're motivated to do the thing as well. And that's the way God intended. That's why he designed this thing called the body. That's why he designed the community of faith in the Old Testament. So the first giant we face is a giant called renewal, to be renewed. And that comes out of Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, which you have abundantly received, uh, that you yield to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, ongoing, every day, daily sacrifice. Kill yourself, your desires. This is your spiritual service of worship. This is how you worship God. You don't have to bring an animal and kill it. You bring yourself and put yourself at the disposal of our Lord and Master. Those of you who are studying Romans know that the word for yield, present, same idea. And yield... To me, it's a little more passive, like, oh, all right, let, yeah, let the guy go first. I like the idea, the concept of this word is present. Here I am, Lord, send Aaron. <laughs> That's what Moses said. It should have been. <laughs> Here I am, Lord, send me, as Isaiah said. That's the better one. Okay, so you want to renew yourself. That means be brought back to a state of being new. Gee, what state do we have of bringing new? Oh, when we were babies, yeah. That's, that's, that means respect a baby. No, we were born again in the image of um, our Lord and Savior as opposed to the image of Adam. So the basic task of renewal is to sanctify yourself. Okay? Word for sanctify is to make holy, separate or distinct. There should be a verse on that somewhere down here. Be ye holy, for I am holy, First Peter chapter 1. That's probably down on the next screen. Um, and the reason we're able to get our act together and don't do the stuff that the unbelievers do, because scriptures say in the New Testament, you've had enough time to do the stuff that those pagans do. Now, get busy doing the stuff you're supposed to be doing for God. The reason is we've changed our perspective. So things that we go into our perspective. We no longer view life as what do we get out of it, but we view it as what does God get out of it? 
We need to change our perspective, our identity, who we are. Don't answer this out loud, but think for a second. Who are you? It, it not, don't use your name, but just describe like who you are. What are you? What comes to your mind? Um, I work at this and that. No, no, that, 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 that changes. So, you know, you change your job, that means you change your identity. What are you at your core? The, the view I adopted of myself is earlier in my Christian life is I am a servant of the Most High God. That's why I exist, to serve him. That's all right, my identity, a servant of the Most High God. There's no higher calling. You, know, you want to go for the gusto? Go for being a servant of the Most High God. Uh, you need to renew your identity, who you are, your purpose for living, your mind, will, and emotions and values. That's what your soul is. Um, all those things need to get renewed from a biblical perspective. Then you will do the correct stuff rather than the wrong stuff. Because what's in the heart affects what you do. So I was driving here this morning. I uh, was listening to the fact that it's a um, anniversary of uh, atomic bomb being dropped in Japan, and there was someone lamenting the fact that like 117 million people died. And yeah, that's not good. But they, do they lament the fact as to why that happened? Do they lament the fact that there was emperor worship going on and that the Japanese would? fight to the death and never give up. And we saved a lot of Japanese as well as American lives by doing that. Do they think beyond just the 117 million? No, 75% of the people will just look at the detail and forget everything else. Do they put it in the bigger perspective? More people have died under communism than all wars in recorded history. Do we ever think about that? The, you know, I forget how many, I used to have, I have this overhead for this from my Western Civ classes. There's six and a million in there and there might be another zero or two. It's just like a huge number of people have been killed under uh, totalitarian regimes. Do we put that in perspective and say, we need to address some of these other things. We actually have people who are still advancing communism, which always winds up killing people who disagree with it. Same thing could be said about what's going on in other religious wars. Uh, people just look at one act and say, oh, we need to get rid of this one act. Knives kill people, let's get rid of all knives. Guns kill people, get rid of all guns. Bombs kill people, get rid of all bombs. Um, and instead of realizing, well, there are things that can be used correctly if people have the correct thinking about things. Um, how we think of ourselves, our identity, and uh, how we think about life determines what we do, plus or minus. If you think correctly about yourself, you'll wind up doing things that are beneficial for you and others, both short-term and long-term. If you think incorrectly about yourself, you'll wind up doing things that are negative for yourself and others, both short-term and long-term. Wow, there's some consistency there. So I had so many verses to, that I wanted to be able to cram in here on this, and I decided just to do a few, and I'm probably going to overwhelm you anyway. But John 8, verse 32, Jesus said to the disciples who believed in him, if you continue or abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And what's the mark of a disciple? You will know the truth. And what's the mark of someone who knows the truth? The truth will set you free. You will have power over the way you were. Jesus prayed in John 17, a couple chapters later, last prayer before the uh, you know, in the garden before he went to the cross. He said, Father, sanctify them with thy truth. Speaking of those who would believe through the disciples' words, thy word is truth. So you got to learn the truth, and then you got to apply it, and then you love others with it. And to do that, you have to walk in wisdom and love. There's stuff coming up on that. This is doable. Uh, here we are. This was a line from someone. We have to believe we can be different from our old ways before we can be renewed. God is at work in you, says Philippians 2, to will and to do his good pleasure. That means you need to be sensitive to the spirit of God who's nudging you, saying, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. He's guiding you. 
fact, I think a great way to do it is that you look at it's something as simple as the proverb of the day. You should go through that chapter. Look at it, and in your mind, you should be saying, I got that. I don't have that. I should have that. I got that. I'm a good model of that. I kind of got that, but I'm not really a good model of it. I should be a good model of that. You should be going through evaluating your life against the scripture. Then at the end, you can say, I'm doing okay. And if you're saying, I'm not doing too good, don't give up. It doesn't, it's not going to get better if you give up. You need to purpose that you are going to do better, and then you'll see that God will provide opportunities for you to do better. If any person is in Christ, he is a new creation. Okay? You're not what you used to be. You're different. It goes on to elaborate how you're a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And the thing that disturbs me about this a little bit, my grammar geeky side comes out every now and then, is that it's a perfect tense. It's not our becoming new. It's not an arrow looking at the whole picture. It's a perfect, which means that it kind of happened. But then I look at people's lives and I said, that's not true. And then I go look at the letter he's writing to the Corinthians and saying, that's not true. He's kind of really getting on their case for not doing what they're supposed to do. And then just three verses later, he says, we beseech you, therefore, be reconciled to God. And it's not a justification verse. It's God saved us so we could have a relationship with him. This word for reconcile is actually be exchanged, be exchanged into this new relationship. That's what God's looking for. Um, another person, or some, continue the quote from someone in the body. Any doubts that we have about becoming new will also become true. In other words, we won't become new. We will stay, you know, the same sinning, smelly person that we always were. Um, Two verses just out of Deuteronomy. We're going to be looking at the heart when we do Deuteronomy. Chapter 10, Moses' last speech before he uh, goes to die up in the hills and the nation of Israel trusts over the Jordan River and Joshua to march around Jericho. He says, circumcise your heart and quit being stiff-necked. Stop being stubborn. Be malleable. Be receptive to what God has to say. Then in chapter 30, he says, the Lord will circumcise your heart. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I mean, chapter 10, he tells you we're supposed to do it. And then in 30, he says he's going to do it. Well, if you know what happens after 30, it's after they've been disciplined, after they've gotten all the curses, and then God brings them back. So I would much rather do the heart surgery early myself than have to experience all the grief and pain uh, that the nation of Israel has gone through for all their history. But the reason I threw this in here is a circumcised heart is a heart, circumcised the forcing of your heart. It's got the, you know, the, the uh, sensitivity increase to God so that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, that you may truly live. So God wants us to become renewed so we can really experience life as he intended. And then... This, this is probably one of my favorite verses. And, and the reason I like this verse is because there's so much bogus concepts of love in Christendom today. People do not have pure biblical love. They have self-centered, self-serving affection for themselves that they then kind of smush on others. So they feel good about themselves. And that's not, you can't love biblically unless you've done what 1 Peter 1 says. You need to first purify your souls by obeying the truth through the prompting and power of the Holy Spirit so that you now have a pure, sincere, unhypocritical love for fellow believers. Then you love one another, fellow believers, fervently, and you can do that because you now have a pure heart. If you do not have a pure heart, you're a hypocrite. And in chapter Romans 12, he's going to talk about love be without hypocrisy. So Paul says it. Peter says it. Uh, you need to do this. So some quick applications here. Um, this is a conglomerate of what people in the body had said. How do I view myself? Uh, what gets me excited? What do I value? 
What do I love? Is the stuff that I love carnal, fleshly, temporal, it's not going to last? Or is it spiritual, enduring, will last forever? Why do I do what I do? Why do I want what I want? And remember, the basic answer to this one is because we wanted to. Why do we want to? Because we think it's more beneficial to do it than not. Have I sought God's perspective or help in the things I'm trying to do? How have I done that? This is where you lay out your requests before God in your quiet time and say, God, here's the stuff that I think would please you. What do you think? I need your help. Am I holding back a part of myself or am I holding back a part for myself? Do you know one of the first acts of God as the New Testament church got constituted was to kill people who were selling their house and giving it to, to the benefit of others? <laughs> yeah. God kills people in the New Testament. Who knew? It must have been really bad people. No, they were actually, they sold their house. And they could have given whatever they wanted, but they kind of lied about what they were doing to make themselves look good. And God said, you're zapped. Uh, what if God took away all my stuff from me? How would I be? Would it be like Job saying, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord? Or they sell, oh, you're a big meanie God, I'm not going to serve you anymore. And actually people have that perspective and it's like, yeah, it's, it's so foolish. To whom does everything belong? Well, we know from when the temple was being dedicated that Solomon prayed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that everything comes from God. He's the one who gives power and might and the ability to accumulate wealth and do all this other stuff. And it hasn't, you know, it's actually accurate if you look around and think. How willing am I to let go of my ambitions, my directions, my goals, my relationships, my things, my stuff? Well, my perspective is it's not my stuff. So it should be pretty easy to say, Lord, what do you want done with your stuff? Lord, what do you want done with your servant? Lord, what do you want done with my life? That's the things we should be saying to God on a regular basis. Okay, so well, this is going to be tight. I originally titled this, How Do You Know Your Giant's Slain and Dead? But it didn't, you know, took too much room on the line. So how do you know you beat your giant? How do you, when do you know you get victory? You know the truth and it set you free from sin. You no longer do or desire to do what displeases God. And instead, you want to please him because 2 Corinthians 5 says you're going to appear before his judgment seat. So make sure you're going to do well there. And you want to do that because your mind and values are daily being renewed and reinforced with his truth. So you know, we look at the scriptures. It says this is what we're supposed to do. We try to do it. And then it gets repeatedly reinforced the more time you spend in the scriptures. So you do that so you're daily delighting in the person of God. You're faithfully trusting in the very about his perfect will as you daily present or sacrifice yourself. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world any longer, but be metamorphosized or transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may test and approve and experience that good, acceptable, and P-E-R-F-E-C-T, perfect will of God. There's nothing better than that. Another way you know your giant's dead when you recognize your life is not your own. You've been bought or redeemed. Your temple of the Holy Spirit. Didn't you know that? He dwells in you. Therefore, you need to keep in step with him or march with him, according to Galatians 5.25. And newsflash, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, he owns you. Hence, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, your ambitions, your aspirations. All that stuff is God's. So use it for him. You know that you've achieved the victory when you have crucified your temporal desires. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires and daily serve the Lord. You're also submitted to God's Holy Spirit. You draw on grace, power, and word to detect and rebuke the schemes of the devil, who is actually going to be trying to get you off track as hard as he does anything else. Um, so James 4 talks about that. Chains of old habits and thinking are broken, not just habits, but thinking, and you now bear fruit for God in eternal life. So a little additional application of that is like, what fruit are you bearing? Is it to God to bring him glory? Proving yourself to be his disciple, Ella John 15, or is it just for yourself? Okay, number, giant number two, relationships. These get 
much shorter. Because once you get the renewal piece in, everything else tends to flow. Um, in fact, as I've kind of looked a little bit about the fruit of revivals, it's just the person's decision to go forward was a dedication of themselves to God's purposes. And if you have that and you're you know, willing to overcome what other people think about you, then God will start nudging you in the wrong, right direction. He'll give you the resources you need to make it happen. So, um, I misspelled, or it should be an H. And, anyway, anyway, it's relationships, believe me or not. Uh, we love as he's loved us. Okay, that's really simple. Okay, so I've got a pure love, and now I love as God has loved me. Well, how has God loved me? Well, Jesus said, my commandment, folks, believers, is that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, and they lay down their life, their dreams, their aspirations, their time, their resources, blah, 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 for the benefit of others. He who loves God must love his brother also, which means you first start with loving God. That's why there's a series on loving God and others. The first command is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then you're in a position to love others as yourself. And uh, people just say, oh, yeah, I love the name of Jesus. <laughs> no, it's just... Do you, do you love God, the Creator? Do you understand Him? Um, so, there's a Philippians two is another great passage on this. You all know this. You make my joy complete. Be like-minded, intent on one purpose. Consider others as more important than yourself. And a little acrostic here for those of you who have little minds. <laughs> uh, joy, Jesus, others, yourself. <laughs> okay, you want joy? Jesus first. Other second, and little all you last. Okay, that's if you look at it from that perspective. And I think it's legitimate to say, Well, what about me? We'll go to chapter four. My God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Um, one of the things that makes relationships difficult is we get stubborn and you know, stuck in our ways. So, uh, James, oh, is it four, two, four, three, three? Anyway, it's in James. Being easily entreated. Wisdom from above is easily entreated. If you've got God's perspective, you're able to defend it and dis, you know, discuss it. And you're willing to yield um, so that you can create unity. We are to submit to one another, says Ephesians 5.18, in the fear of God, knowing that God's going to judge us based on how we have submitted to one another. And not only is God going to judge us, but 1 Peter 5 tells us Satan's there judging us as well, looking for how can I snatch him? Glory in mind. He's looking to devour you. Um, I love this verse because I can always remember where it is. It's right in 1 Corinthians 1.10, so it's like very easy to find in my Bible. And the Corinthians were, yeah, not exactly class A saints. More like class omega saints. But anyway, um, all speak the same thing that there be no divisions, that you be perfectly joined together like a fine dovetail joint in the same mind and the same judgment. That means you, under the Holy Spirit's influence, discussed and decided what the Spirit of God wants. Colossians 3 says, keep the unity of the, Colossians 4, 3, unity of the Holy Spirit by means of the bond of peace. And that would bring my mind back to 1 Corinthians 12. You know, you, we're all one body baptized into this one entity uh, to accomplish God's work. Another great passage on, in chapter 12, so it's very easy for me to remember. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. Um, Let love be without hypocrisy. And this is the word for speaking under a mask. So, you know, you, you know how the uh, theatrical things have the happy mask and the sad mask. So for people that really want good actors, you just held up the mask and they knew, oh, they're being happy. <laughs> or, oh, they're being sad. Or, you know, it's like, um, it's before they had to school of performing arts to tell people how to actually present themselves. That way. Um, so well, love be without hypocrisy. Abhor, hate what is evil. And I love this translation because I just made it up. Be glued to what's good. <laughs> now, this word for glue actually means to glue. Um, the version said embrace what's good or uh, in the scriptures it's used of being joined to something, being joined to what is good. 
you, you get stuck to what's good. Um, and then the next verse, First Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, you've got the transformed mind. But then you've got the transformed actions of what happens in the body in the following chapters. Uh, be philostrophagos, or something like that, philostrophagos. Okay, two words, and we're going to make it easy. Philo and stroge. Okay, philo means friend. We get, so Philadelphia is brotherly love, but philo was a friend, philos. Uh, this was the guy that would actually arrange your marriage for you and then organize the banquet. It was a friend that was like, whoa, that's a lot of good work. Someone you could really trust. And stroge is this fond affection. It's, it's an affection word. And uh, most of your uh, lexicons will talk about it. Oh, it's like family love. But if you look at it, what happens, be fondly affectionate towards one another with brotherly love. Well, wait a minute, we already covered the brotherly love in the first place. So it talks about a bond of friendship and affection, which uh, is used of husband and wife as well as family members. But it, it goes beyond just mere brotherly love. The, the fellowship of the body of believers can supersede that of uh, mere familial love. One of the things that makes that happen is in honor, we give preference to one another. So these are two one another passages right here. So there's a bunch of verses that specifically use a Greek word that means one another of what believers are supposed to do with one another. Not talking about the world out there, not talking about some mission field somewhere, but what you're supposed to do with the people that are in the same sanctuary or room with you. And then in that service and preference to one another, we don't lag in diligence. We're not lazy slugs but we are fervent in spirit and we're doing this in our service to the Lord. We serve his body. It's like we, we can't see Jesus, but we can see his body. His head's way up there in the clouds. So now we got the stuff that's down here. That's us. And, and a verse that I think a great correlation to this is first Peter four ten. Uh, take whatever God's given you and use it for the benefit of serving others as a good steward of the grace of God. We minister grace to each other. Grace is power. So our interaction should empower each other to be holy, empower each other to be loving, empower each other to greater you know, sacrificial service. Um, and, you know, I think our praise time does that. I think our edification time does that. Although I don't hang out in all the girls' edifications most of the time. Um, but that's the thing that's supposed to happen. So this is where the renewal has its audition. And if the audition goes poorly, it's usually because the renewal has not affected us deeply enough. Applications that some of the body came up with. How do my relationships edify me? What do I get out of them? And we actually should think about this. There's a selfish aspect to the relationships, but then there's another where we're pleased that what we can do helps others when we see that happen. When we get appreciated, that's great. But we don't get appreciated, that's even better. <laughs> If we're doing the right thing, you know, we, we could be doing, the reason you're not being appreciated is because you're acting like an idiot. Um, it's that God will make it up to you. So, you know, people didn't always appreciate Paul. They didn't appreciate Jeremiah. They didn't appreciate you, Jeremiah. They didn't appreciate Ezekiel. They didn't appreciate a lot of the people that are called prophets. Um, they didn't appreciate people who would tell them the truth. They didn't appreciate Moses. <laughs> Just like, think about that. But those guys are doing really well now in the future. Now and in the future, I'm getting my uh, Time Lord stuff mixed up. Okay, so how do my relationships edify others? Does my interaction with other with people give them courage to make the choice to go and do the thing that is in their own best interest and that glorifies God? Does it help them or hurt them? Uh, do my relationships please God or Satan? So as God looks down from heaven, is he 
grieved the way his people and his bodies are functioning. And I think that's the case for the most part he does. And Satan's there going, oh yeah, this is great. Um, it should be the other way around where God is saying, oh yeah, this is great. And Satan's going, Rrr. okay, what drives my relationships? Pleasing God or fear of displeasing others or just desire to please myself? What drives them? How do I serve grace to others? Hi, would you like some more grace? <laughs> Try it with a soy sauce dip. It's really good. Um, do I need to seek forgiveness or reconcile with someone? Do I need to humble myself? So pride keeps relationships, uh, keeps people apart. And uh, humility is something that enables us to get more, adds more grace that makes the relationships go more smoothly. Okay, how do you know when your giant's dead? You know that your giant of relationship is dead. When A, you purified your heart, First Peter 1.22, if you haven't memorized that and meditated on it, please do, so that you selflessly serve others and the body in love. Selfless. A lot of people don't serve because, what will people think of me? Oh, I don't want to look bad. It's like, yeah, you don't want to look bad at the judgment seat either, so get on the stick. You selflessly serve others and the body. And this, you know, it's great. It's great examples of this in our body where we not only serve one another, but the body as a whole. We speak the truth in love. We desire and sacrifice our interest for what's in other people's best interest. We give and share what both reproves, edifies, and encourages others so that they will pursue God. So think about your interactions. Do they help people who are struggling to understand what's causing the struggle? That's reproof. Does it build them up? And then does it encourage them to take those baby steps in the right direction? And then does it help them keep on the path when, you know, they're kind of going, oh, I'm really tired. I don't want to do this anymore. You have victory when, number two, you love God and his approval more than pleasing others. You both know the needs and objectives of believers, kind of like the Christian career path, and you seek what's in their best interest. Uh, not just the Christian career stuff path, but you've studied one another so that you kind of figure out, okay, what would they struggle with? What are they struggling with? Why is that happening? You know you achieve victory over your relationships giant when you view yourself as part of his body. You're no longer an individual, but you are Allah Ephesians 4, linked together with other members of the Lordship of Christ, supplying what God has put into you for the benefit of others. God has made us each unique. We're not all supposed to be the same person. Definitely not supposed to be Bill. Um, <laughs> fellowshipping and sharing yourself your resources with like-minded saints as you unite under Christ's Lordship to seek and do God's will. These don't roll off the tongue. I realize that. Um, yeah, I'd have to crunch them and crunch them and crunch them, but it's got all the pieces in there um, that I, I think are essential. And one of these days, I'll put these together in something that flows a little bit more. But we're supposed to be reunited under Christ's Lordship, Ephesians 4. We should be seeking to do his will, which is going to imply building up others. And that will bring him glory in the church, Ephesians 2.22 and in our spheres of influence. So we hear this, even in Bermuda, they say, behold how they love one another. So this is the way it's supposed to be. You get together and complain with uh, you know, non-Christian, you know, non-body friends and complain about the body, then that's probably not gonna make that happen. Okay, the giant of responsibility. Da -da -da -da. This is the time we all hide. Um, real short, okay, so it's not require a lot to um, remember this one. Fulfill your purpose. Why are you on the planet? Why has God equipped you and woven you together wonderfully and fearfully? How is he going to use you? What good works did he create you to do? He's got good works planned. What are they? Your purpose is the eternal glorification of Christ, who is the Lord of glory, and you want to glorify him now so people can behold your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. And Father doesn't mind if Jesus gets a few applause, hands of applause every now and then. And at the Bema seat, 
when he passes out the glory. And you do that through something really simple, faithful love and service. That means you love and serve full of faith. This whole idea of being faithful, back at toil, there's a whole series on it. We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Those are the words I've structured my life so I will hear. You need to structure your life so you hear those. Jesus called the disciples. Matthew 4, he said, dudes, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Forget those sardines. They're going to stink after a week anyway. Three days, I don't know, how long does a fish last? Uh, I'm going to make you catch something that goes on forever, which is people. And then at the end, he said, dudes, make disciples. Who do you say this to? The guys who are fishing for fish again. <laughs> you can kind of want, you know, see why Jesus really was glad to go to the cross. It's like, I want to get out of here. <laughs> you know, they're still fishing for fish after, after all they've been through. After all, you know, it's like, after all the fish I've given them, they're, they're still going for fish. Father, help. Make disciples. Immerse them in the name and power of the triune God and teach them to obey everything that I commanded you. And, dudes, I'll be with you always, even till the end of the earth. Caleb said, if God is with us, we will be victorious. God gave us a lot of information about how to have him with us. John 15, abiding is one of the keys passages for that. But wait, there's more. The job's not done until you've entrusted it to faithful people who will teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.22. That should be 2.2. Two. Yeah, that's, I think I got an extra two in there. The things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And that's in the passage of be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. That's in the passage about being a soldier. That's in the passage of saying it's going to be difficult. You need to be a soldier because the most wicked force on earth is going to oppose every one of your attempts to do this. Think about that. You will not be able to succeed in doing this yourself. You will not be able to succeed if you don't try to do it, trusting God to supply. And as the nation of Israel went from the desert across the Jordan into the promised land to take up their victory, to kill those dirty rotten giants, the waters did not part until they put their foot in them. Back in the Red Sea, it was all dry. But here, you needed to take that step, believing that this is what God was going to wanted you to do, and trust that he would not get your sandals wet. And they passed over on dry land. Quick applications for this. At the end of each day, you ask yourself, how'd I do today? I remember reading Ben Franklin's autobiography uh, 30, 40 years ago, and uh, he used to keep a little ledger. And Ben was a real character. And every time he did something that he realized offended people, he would make a little black mark in his little ledger book. And then at the end of the day, he would, it was Ben and Pencil, uh, go back and reflect on all the little black marks, and he would remember what happened. So the guy was actually going through life consciously with his eyes open and his mind in gear, and he would replay it as to how he would do it again, and then he would erase it. And this is a purely secular guy trying to be a more influential guy. That's something that probably we should consider doing. I mean, I'm really good at beating myself up over things I you know, shouldn't have done. But uh, replaying the correct behavior so that it becomes automatic is a good thing to do. You need to develop skills this is one of those skills, the skill of self-evaluation. I did a sermon on taking heed to yourself. You do it, when you look at the scriptures, say, am I doing this or not doing it? You do it at the end of the day. How did I do? You do it by identifying the spots that are going to trip you up. And then, um, you know, where am I going to be reticent to do God's will? Where am I going to be reticent to love others? And then you figure out how to do that. What did I do to please God today? Well, I got out of bed. Probably a good start. Um, yeah, I uh, kind of made it to church and I 
you know, talk to other believers. Yeah, I guess that's okay. Uh, I I think I sung. Uh, yeah, I, I actually gave a praise. I think I praise God. You know, it's like we, we should have a little more confidence that what we have done is God's will and pleases him. So we can say, yeah, my God's pleased with me. Do I feel guilty? Well, if the guilt fits, don't wear it. <laughs> you know, realize it fits and get rid of it. Toss it. Throw it out by the curb. First uh, John 1, uh, 9. Confess your sin. God's going to be faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you haven't memorized that verse yet, you need your Christian bar of soap. Is my conscience clear? Paul said, oh, it's 30-32. No, no, not 30-32. Something 32. And this do I exercise myself, to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and man. So I, he didn't want to offend God, and he didn't want to unnecessarily offend others, but you know, some people take offense over the slightest things. Um, people. Uh, identify mistakes, ask forgiveness, come up with a plan to change uh, what I don't like and what God doesn't like. So probably I put a, should have put God there first. but uh, And then... How have I helped others be successful in their Christian lives? How have I helped others bring glory to God? How do I, have I helped others so that God's truth is spread? That is this, you know, question that if we, we just kind of ask ourselves these things, reflect on them, and then um, take corrective action, we would make sure the giants stay dead. So renewal, relationships, and responsibility. You've got lots of things that uh, you can go and explore and then ask God to bring to your mind the particular ones that he wants you to um, put a little more attention to. If you were able to get through today's sermon um, without having anything that would apply to your life, you're ready to go to heaven. Just, you know, bye. I mean, I'm sh there's that chariot outside. I'm sure it'll be flying by any minute now. Just hop on it. So there should be some stuff that you should be able to come up with that you want to, you know, get a little more metamorphosized on and uh, live more happily ever after. Okay, questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Thank you for the way you helped the body with that. All right. Victory one, the purpose of your life is eternal and your actions biblical. And most people don't understand the scriptures, so they don't understand what biblical actions are. You're a good steward of all that God has trusted to you for the benefit of others. It's not just giving it to you for, you for yourself. He's given it to you for the benefit of others. Um, he's also given it to you for the glory of God, uh, as well as himself and yourself. So use what God has given you to lay up treasures in heaven. You purposefully seek, first, his kingdom and righteousness. And... You know, I, I distinctly remember the spot where I came across this verse. I said, I'm going to do that. And from that point on, it was no looking back. It was just, you know, I'm going to seek that first. And all the other stuff that I wanted, been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and it's really not worth it. <laughs> you know, yeah, God provided. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. But it's just like um, in the bigger scheme of things, it's, it's just nothing. It's dust. Um, yeah, this is the one I wanted to get to. Thank you. You've equipped yourself, just like you're supposed to do a little heart surgery. Equip yourself. As Paul told T T Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workwoman or workman that needs not be ashamed, who rightly divides the word of truth. And then that truth is what enables you to have a ministry in others' lives. Uh, Timothy's. Equip yourself to function within a body of spiritual warriors. Oh, I don't want to of worries. I just kind of want to sit around and have tea, cream tea probably, little cucumber sandwiches, cream puffs on the side. Um, you know, the, the battle is something that uh, I think the church has tried to shy away from because you know, people say, oh, that battle's bad, they say, as they, you know, have their spies undermining the church. Um, you want to be function within a body of spiritual warriors to finish the race in unity as you seek to win and train the lost. Win and train. Um, for every church that, for every probably thousand churches, to, eh, probably somewhere even more than that, find one that actually wants to train them. 
It's like disciple making. It's not just evangelism. It's very easy to get people to go out and sell things. Not, not that easy. You have to guilt them into it. But to actually train them to make disciples, that's the thing that's really lacking. And we want to make reproductive disciples, teaching them what the Lord has commanded without faltering or turning back. Okay. Now, any more? Should be it. Questions? So you're serving a person, but they are not reciprocating. The command is one another. So you give people a model of what of serving them. So we serve people that are totally unworthy of being served frequently. Eventually they catch on. What do we do if they don't? Why do you have any suggestions? Well, actually, right. Reprove them. And, and reproof is to bring to light. And I've had to do this a couple times where I, I've said, you know, the, the scriptures kind of say this. And um, how do you think you are on reciprocation? Because you're supposed to do it with one another. Uh, you do, do not. What, what do you not get about that? And it's, it's, it's an awkward conversation, but it's really in your best interest for them to realize that God requires this of us. I mean, if they are not laying down their life for the benefit of others, they are disobeying Jesus. If they're not laying down five minutes for the benefit of others, they're disobeying Jesus. So, you know, let's work on getting five minutes first. Let's just get some reciprocation and then move on. So love is... How does God deal with his people who don't love him? Malachi is a great book on that. And, and, and I love it because it's, it's the last book of the Old Testament, so I can always find it. And it's God basically saying, you know, where's the love that you're supposed to have for me? You know, I'm a king. Where, where, where's the stuff? Try, try giving to your governor what you give me. Would he accept that? I wouldn't accept that from you. Now, God does not need their stuff. They need to give it to him. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need some hamburger. You know, but he, they need to give God their best because that is what he has set up the rules and he requires. And they don't do that. They're, they're going to suffer eventually. So if people are takers rather than givers, um, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than receive. It's an ax, one of those. You know, you know, little Sunday school thing. You know, what are the last verses of Jesus? Um, there's actually some more in the uh, book of Revelation, but in the Gospels and Acts, uh, those are his last words. Some are places to give and receive. Um, which I've always taken as a matter of making fun of folks. It's much better to give than receive. But anyway, <laughs> another elaboration on that or question on that? Or another one? Um, would it be the correct way of thinking that, okay, well, I have to be perfect at the role before I can take the next step to relationships, and then I have to be perfect at relationships before I can be responsibility? That's not been my experience. It's, you know, no, you start right. to renew, and then God brings relationships in your life, and that actually helps to, to produce more renewal, and then God expects usually more, the responsibility is very often times bigger than, you know, um, you feel so comfortable doing, because it's been encouraging to trust him. So, yeah, it, they, they, they slide back and forth. Yeah. Um, in fact, the communists, when they are training people, will first put them out on the, the when they want to be a communist, they will put them out on the street. This is from Douglas Hyde, uh, chairman, uh, uh, secretary of the British Communist Party back in the oh, 40s, 50s, 60s, probably pre-60s, because I read the book in the 70s. Um, the, the guy wanted to be a communist, they first have him sell the, the paper. And then uh, everybody gives them abuse and so some people quit and then they don't worry about them because <laughs> but the ones who you know are basically can't answer the questions that are being raised against them somebody will slide up to them and say hey, brother <laughs> would you be interested in a class that we have on this subject and then the person would attend the class and they would be more interested in getting the information because they now know it's useful so getting people to share I, I've seen, unfortunately, a lot of people share and alienate people up right and sideways because their motivation for sharing 
is to look good in the eyes of people, not because of a love or concern for them. So it, 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 it's a little tricky. Um, you don't have to be perfect at them. You're, you're never going to get perfect at all these things, but you're going to get functional. I'm a big believer in being, just being competent, and then you can kind of look at certain things to excel in, but you, you basically want to get your bases covered. So you, you want to know what the truth says. You want to be able to apply it to your life. And then you want to figure out how you can use the truth in the life of others. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us, created us for a purpose. Um, you have invited us to participate in your plan for this planet and promise incredible, outrageous rewards as a result of our faithfulness to you. You also make available everything we need to do what you want us to do. So help us see clearly through Satan's schemes and lies that says we're inadequate or unable or it's impossible or it's not going to be worth it. And help, help us instead develop a relationship with you where we draw in your spirit, have your perspective, and your purposes fulfilled in our lives. We commit ourselves to this task for your glory's sake in Christ's name. Amen.